John Berko, hello. Hello, good Thank morning. Thank you to be with us this morning. My pleasure. So my first question was, is about uh, how do you feel for 2020? How do you, is there some, um, um, uh, what do you fear for the 2020 in economics plans? Global terrorism, mm -hmm. the persistence and the unpredictability of it, the threat, the continuing threat of climate change, and obviously, from the vantage point of a Brit, mm -hmm. Brexit. These are three huge concerns, so far as I'm concerned, uh, allied to which, of course, is the uncertainty about the United States presidential election, and more widely for society and the world, the phenomenon mm -hmm. of populism, the trumpeting of simplistic slogans to address complex and multifaceted problems. I would like to see a resurgence mm -hmm. of parliamentarism, the assertion by legislatures of their important role in the political and decision-making processes. And in particular, as Speaker of the UK Parliament for 10 years, I believe in the idea that the Parliament is there to question, to probe, to scrutinize, and to hold to account the government of the day. Mm -hmm. um, my second question is about uh, uh, with the Brexit, um, with which sort of uh, relationship we are going to see between UK and uh, United, United States? Well, at the moment, it looks as though the UK is headed for a Canada-style mm -hmm. Brexit. That is what Prime Minister Johnson wants. That means not having regulatory alignment with the European Union. He's made it clear that he doesn't want that. He's looking to diverge rather than to align and to maximize the scope for free trade deals. The consequence of that is that access to the European market is going to be more challenging and difficult. I don't think the European mm -hmm. Union is just going to roll over to what the UK wants. It's a negotiation. So will there be a trade agreement between the UK and the EU? I think that's very uncertain. I think there might be some sort of skeleton or outline agreement on goods, but it's going to be much more difficult for the UK to get an agreement on services, mm -hmm. which account for a large proportion of the UK economy. And as far as the US is concerned, we may get some sort of agreement with the US, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get an agreement within 12 months. And if the priority is to be able to say, look, we've got an agreement, well, then obviously, the United States is going to push very aggressively, as it always does, mm -hmm. to protect its own economic and commercial and political interests, which will, of course, come far ahead in American minds of the interests of the UK. We're in an election year. Dealing with the United States in any trade negotiation is always a very taxing mm -hmm. challenge. But to deal with this president, who's not the most obviously stable president of the United States, and in an election year, is doubly taxing. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult. I don't say we won't get an agreement, but it's going to be very, very hard fought. And it will be a matter of accommodations, of deals, of compromises. Mm -hmm. I think what you're seeing at the moment is, for example, in the European context, the EU setting out its position and Prime Minister Johnson setting out his and that of the British government. But those are just opening statements. The detail, the complexity, the argument, the bartering, the haggling, mm -hmm. the forging of compromises are all down the track. And that's really the point of great interest, I think. So we, are talking, we were talking about uh, with the Brexit, the relationship between uh, USA and, um, and UK. But uh, during many years, you have uh, most of um, US enterprise, they use uh, UK as a, a base, a business base, to, to create a sort of bridge for, for Europe. Look, is it going to change? Is there this um, uh, US company, are they going to come directly to, to Europe? Is there, is there a risk? There's a risk that some of them won't do so. It's a much more challenging scenario now for the UK. Let's be clear, we were a very attractive location in the UK for inward investment from the United States and elsewhere, not purely because of our own merits, but because of our membership of the European Union and the European single market. We have voluntarily exited <laughs> the largest power block of which we were part and 
the trade bloc which was our nearest neighbour. Once you've walked away from those, some of your attractiveness to overseas investors diminishes. I want the best for my country. I want better mm -hmm. living standards, improved growth, enhanced productivity, bigger volumes of trade, and I hope that we can find a way to achieve those things. But in the short term, we have given up the best deal, which was to be part of the single market and the European Union, and we're now going to have to try somehow to contrive and fashion a good deal. Will that hope happen overnight? It won't. Will it happen at all? Well, it remains to be seen, but it's going to be a big challenge for policymakers. Um, this morning, there were a conference. Um, it was a USA. What kind of superpower after the 2020 presidential election? So, what is your answer of, of this of this uh, question? And uh, how did this superpower? How did you see this, this superpower evolve under Trump? President Trump has veered more towards isolationism than not. Uh, he has been much more reluctant to engage with the problems of the world. For example, with the fight against climate change, uh, he's been very lukewarm about NATO. He has been nothing like as pro-British as mm -hmm. some previous American presidents have been. Quite how he will evolve if he is re-elected is uncertain. Will he continue with more of the same or will he adopt a different posture? I think the key point is what does he think is in the interests of his base? How does he play to his base? And if he is re-elected, I think that the chances are that you will get more assertive Trumpism, more of the Americans going their own way. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is if there is a Democrat elected to the White House. I don't say there will be a dramatic mm -hmm. transformation. There is always continuity in foreign policy. A Democrat president will have to have regard to domestic trade interests and the situation of American workers. And that's always been the case. But I think the, the main difference would be in mindset. Trump is very much focused on America first, yes. America first, America first. And the Amer idea America of him only. alone. America only. <laughs> America only. <laughs> America first and America yeah. only. Yeah. I think if there were a Democrat in the White House who had a more collaborative and multilateral approach to global problems, that would be good both for relations between the US and the UK and for relations between the US and Europe. So I mm -hmm. would have thought a lot of people in Europe would hope for a change in the White House. Mm -hmm. But it's very uncertain at the moment uh, to call which way it's going to go. Do, do you think we, um, uh, with Trump, uh, USA they lost uh, um, a little, a little part of influence of the world, and Europe? I think uh, UK and Europe. We have a card to play to be more, to, to have more influence on, the, on on all the world in Africa, in India, in, in I Asia, think potentially in that uh, is so. South America. I think that potentially is so, because I think that the tub-thumping, the breast-beating, the sabre-rattling of the United States have not conduced to greater influence. If anything, I think that they have brought the United States to some degree into disrepute, and therefore their capacity to influence others is much more limited. And I think that there is an opportunity there for other powers to assert themselves. And I hope that those forces will come to the fore. But it will be necessary, of course, for the European Union to speak with one voice, to have a clear view in its approach, for example, to trade policy, in its approach to China, in its approach to Iran. And all of these are challenges which lie ahead over the next 12 months to 24 months. Just my last question is about, is about um, the Chinese, China and Chinese market. Do you think we have an opportunity to, um, to create more relationship with, uh, with uh, China, with Chinese uh, enterprise today, with the uh, UK and Europe? There is such an opportunity, and uh, it's an opportunity to be taken seriously, although there is also a responsibility on the part of policymakers in the UK and Europe to balance the pursuit of commercial interest on the one mm -hmm. hand and the promotion of our civilized values and commitment to human rights on the other. And we cannot forget and should not neglect the fact that although 
China is a very big power which has embraced trade and to some degree competitive capitalism. The polity of China is still very much a closed world, a dictatorship, mm -hmm. a one-party state and an egregious abuse of human rights, not only in Hong Kong but elsewhere. So yes, I would like to see a good trade relationship with China, but I would also like us to try to use our soft power to achieve some changes in Chinese domestic policy. Now that mm -hmm. may seem a very, very big task, but just because it's a very big task and just because it may be beyond us doesn't obviate the need to keep repeating important messages about democracy, about pluralism, about civilized values, about respect for human rights, about acknowledgement of the territorial integrity of other countries. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you Don't very much. Thank you for your time.